welcome to the first of our four flight workshop series. My name is Mike Jesh. I'm an airline pilot and a flight instructor in Southern California. And first I'd like to give you just a couple of notes about how we're going to try to work this series tonight and going forward. This workshop will be recorded. And the recordings for this and all the eventual final workshops, they'll be available on the fourflightworkshops.com website. Brian will have a QR link for you on that just in a few minutes. Uh, now, I've been using and teaching on iPads and with ForeFlight for over a decade, and I thought I knew how to work it pretty well, but every time I work with Brian on one thing or another, I learn even more, and I'm sure you will too tonight. So our plan is to host one of these programs on the first Monday of every month until we cover basically all of the features that we can think of. And uh, so the, the duration of this series will depend to some extent on how much interest you've got, your Q&A back and forth. No doubt ForeFlight's going to come out with some more features along the way. And so we'll have to introduce another program to cover that. So um, without any further ado, let's bring on our main presenter tonight, Captain Brian Schiff. Now, Brian has been taking, <laughs> taking flying lessons since before he was born, and he's now been an airline pilot for over 30 years. He currently flies the Airbus A320, and he's a flight instructor based in North Texas. Welcome, Brian. Come on in. Hey, Mike. Thanks a lot. Thanks for doing the intro. And, uh, you know, I've learned just as much from you as well. And everybody I talk to with ForeFlight, uh, it's a fantastic, probably most popular app for flight planning and in-flight use as well. And every time we have a question we can't answer, we find something. And it's a great, great learning experience because you can never learn it all. In fact, the techs at ForeFlight make sure of that because they keep coming out with new updates all the time just to make sure that we don't have it down pat all the time. But we're gonna do our best. That's why I thought it would be great to have this kind of workshop where we actually get some interaction from people who are using it. I'm not gonna say that I know it more than everybody out there. There may be an expert among you and you may have some tips and tricks and we would love to hear those tips and tricks. Um, so put them in the Q&A. We're gonna keep track of all those and we'll be certain to post them on the website, uh, fourflightworkshops.com. There's a, a URL up a, one of those things over. Uh, you'll see it again and you'll see it in the uh, emails before and after the webinars as well, uh, the workshops that is. So feel free to chime in and, and, and you're helping to form and create this course. The content will be created by you as well. Uh, also helping us tonight is uh, Bob Mater. Bob's a close friend of mine. We met at a flight school 20 years ago, 20 something years ago, where we were both flight instructing out in uh, oh. St. Louis. Uh, he's a former chairman of the board of uh, the National Association of Flight Instructors. And uh, we are both board members now. He's currently serving as the chairman emeritus uh, and currently flight instructing and an avid for flight user. So he's uh, uh, one of our experts who will be answering questions in the background. And I'm sure that we're gonna probably need to accumulate some more people who, who are experts with this and, and can help. Um, so welcome, Bob, glad to have you too. Thanks for helping. Well, well I'm glad to be here and I'm glad to help. Uh, one thing uh, we didn't get on my bio is I'm also a lead, a lead rep. So uh, there we go. <laughs> Everybody, right. all 1,000, however many, I can't see the count right now, but 1.5 thousand of you um, that are here tonight, uh, we'll be, uh, We'll work diligently to get your uh, get your credits in, and uh, looking forward to helping out. Looking forward to uh, teaching and learning more about four flight. I've been using it since it came out as well, and uh, Brian will get this because I was on because he and I were both on a border region of uh, border of two different uh, FAA regions. We had to carry about fifty pounds of paper in our flight bags all the time to teach instruments. So. <laughs> For, if nothing else, four flights a blessing there. It's not like carrying my old organic chemistry textbook anymore. So with that, I'll get out of the way and uh, let's have some fun learning about All this. All right, one. sounds great. Thanks, Bob. And thanks for, again, helping in the background, answering questions as we can. If they're good and appropriate for this workshop, they're, they're going to feed them to me and I'll answer them live. Again, we're going to start out kind of basic. It might seem painfully slow for a lot of you. If you're an advanced user, bear with us. Um, hopefully you'll get something tip or trick or two out of this program. Eventually toward the end, we'll get into a little bit of flight planning and some fun stuff, but I'm going to get into the basics, some iPad usage and stuff like that so that, uh, uh, we can just build on a foundation. So if you come to future four flight workshops or you recommend it to your students, be sure that they watch the old recordings first. 
they'll all be available on fourflightworkshops.com. So the older recordings will be a prerequisite and we're going to assume that you've watched them when you go on to the, the future ones and then already have that knowledge base. Um, I'll also make the slides available for this PowerPoint uh, on the website as well afterwards. Um, so also very exciting is I've been uh, approached by uh, my good friend Russ Still from Gold Seal and he has offered to give away two um, uh, classes, two ground school courses for either private pilot or instrument pilot, whichever you're working on. That's at a $300 value. Gold Seal Ground Schools is great. They have an awesome reputation for prepping for a written exam and then even beyond that. And all flight instructors, you can actually get it for free and monitor the progress of your, your student uh, as they enroll and work their way through that training course as well. Just a great program. Two of you tonight will be on. You got to be present on here to win it. Uh, we've also um, got a uh, uh, NAFI membership, a one-year membership for somebody. We'll give that away to somebody on here. And also, a, uh, I have this uh, flight gear by folding knee board. It's great to hold your iPad while you're flying. You can see in the picture there, although in that picture, I think you might have trouble pulling the yoke back, uh, the control wheel. I don't know, maybe you wouldn't want it like that while you're flying. Anyway, it's a great iPad holder, knee board. One of you will have that as well. We'll be pulling for, at random at about the one hour mark. Uh, we are gonna go 90 minutes, planning to go 90 minutes. We'll stop recording and we'll hang out as long as you guys wanna ask questions and talk and just chit chat informally after that. But the recording will stop at about 90 minutes. Uh, Let's see what else. Also, the one year membership to NAFI, uh, you know, I, I got a pretty good discount. I get everything I can get. I get the pro plan on four flight. I get all the Jeppesons and NAFI members get a 33% uh, a discount on that, which is uh, pretty much you profit from that. Um, if you're uh, watching this recording and you're watching it after the fact, don't worry. Uh, we'll continue to give away Gold Seal Ground School courses at each subsequent uh, workshop that we have. One other thing I'd just like to quick plug is at the end of uh, October this year is uh, the National Association of Flight Instructors holding a summit uh, for flight instructors in uh, Lakeland, Florida. Go to uh, nafinet.org and you can look at some more details on that. We've got a website dedicated to that or you can scan the QR here. If I advance it too fast, then you can go back and watch the recording. So with that, I think we will move on to talking about our technology here. Uh, for those who've been flying a long time, I mean, can you imagine if someone showed you an iPad with ForeFlight on it when you were wrestling map folding and plotting courses on sectionals and, and going through all that and, and trying to figure out where you are by looking at a lake or a train track? And then if someone just showed you the iPad at that point, would you not have just went, holy cow? Uh, it's an amazing tool that we have. It's, and like Bob said, the JEPS revisions that we that we had to carry. Remember doing revisions if you're an instrument rated pilot, going through and taking out the old, putting in the new. Now we just we hit update and watch the little blue bar go across and 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 have a sip of coffee. That's a, the way to do it now. It's so gentlemanly. It's also daunting. Um, learning the iPad is kind of like learning to walk. Learning the uh, four flight app is like learning to walk. Uh, you're not going to get it right away. You're going to have to keep using it, try to figure things out. Um, my wife laughs at me because I'll power it up while I'll let her drive the car when we're going somewhere because it's a different beast when you're actually moving. And I will sit in a course and I will always use it and I'll play with it while we're driving somewhere. And the more you play with it, and that's what I'm going to encourage you is to use it as much as you can uh, to learn it. Again, tonight, let's keep it interactive. So ask questions. Mike and Bob will feed them to me or answer them live or type them up in the, in the Q&A. Um, the safe word for the night will be slow down. So if you just say slow down in there, uh, they'll send me a message and I'll, I'll slow down a little bit because I don't want to overwhelm anybody by, by going too fast. So we're going to talk about uh, uh, iPad ch choices at, in the beginning and how to set up the iPad and ForeFlight. Basic settings, we couldn't possibly get into all of them tonight, but we're gonna get into the basic ones. And then at the end, we'll get into some basic flight planning, just to start at A to B, how do you do this? And then maybe go over some tips and tricks. I'll start with a PowerPoint, and when we'll end, we'll end with the tips and tricks on that, and then we'll actually go to the real iPad, start looking at it. 
we will graduate to maybe workshop three or four, hooking the iPad up to X-Plane, actually flying while we're using the iPad, uh, and, and we'll start planning cross-country flying and see what kind of questions come up as we're planning and just kind of take it interactive. I've taught many four flight seminars and what I've discovered is the things that I create on the slides aren't necessarily what you need to learn. The questions are all over the board and I want to dedicate that to what you guys want. And that's why we're going to keep this interactive. And I fully plan on learning quite a bit from, uh, from you as well. At about halfway through 45 minutes or so, I do plan to take a break. Uh, I don't want you to miss anything, and I'm drinking coffee as a precaution to make sure I get a reminder in about 45 minutes that, to, to, to take that break. So, if uh, Mike, if you could launch poll number four, I think that uh, this is something I didn't ask in the registration phase for most of you, and I just would like to know if you're okay if we just send you an email about questions that are answers, the frequency asked questions, the next any information we, we might have to change the date of uh, one of our workshops it will only be used by us we will not share it with anybody and it will be purely for uh, our correspondence with you and mostly for answering unanswered questions because i'm sure that we're going to have some of those as we go along so as soon as we get a little bit more of these answered we'll uh, end it uh, in the meantime the website down there at the bottom and it'll be on most of the slides fourflightworkshops.com We'll have all the Q&A, the answers to the questions you asked. We'll post them on there. Um, you can send us emails and questions. You can send us tips and tricks. We might actually learn something from you and we'll share it with everybody else. So we'd like to keep that uh, updated. Uh, that will be the, the clearinghouse and the, the central place to go for all of the documents we talk about. And, uh, and I will mention some. And, uh, and all the recordings will be linked on that website as well. Um, this Zoom account, our equipment, and some of the emailing program software that we're going to be paying for, it's expensive. We are not charging anything for this. Um, we are going to accept donations if you want them to donate through the website. That'll only pay for the expenses, and once those are, are met, we're going to donate to any kind of aviation education organization, uh, like one of our biggest supporters is the Ventura County 99s, and I know we have a lot of 99s on board. Welcome to you guys. Uh, I thank you for the 99s helping to get the word out about this as well. So uh, we will be donating whatever extra there is to uh, organizations like them. The website will have the advisory circular. The Four Flight Manual will be on there as well. Of course, you can get that on the Four Flight website as well. <clears throat> I'm going to end the poll. And uh, thank you all for that. I don't think we need to share the results on that. It was just for our internal use, but uh, there we go. We've kind of evolved into a heads down society. We may have started out as one and we've evolved back into one. And while this is kind of comical, it's also true. And I think that those of you who are instructors can tell and agree with me that you need to get your students eyes off the iPad, get them back out the window, learn how to use the iPod and the four flight and even your avionics in small chunks. So look down a few seconds, do something, look back up, scan for traffic. Uh, we can't even walk and lose our technology at the same time as proven by this. I thought I didn't hear anybody laughing when I put these comics up there. There's the website that I'm talking about, fourflightworkshops.com. Here's the evolution of a heads down to a heads down society. And uh, this is the people who are using their devices and trying to walk at the same time. <laughs> and well, once again, I don't like showing images or videos of people getting hurt, but this just exemplifies the point. It's happening all over the place. And like I said, you instructors are probably seeing your students do this to some extent as well. <laughs> the warning I'd like to give first is and this is this is old data this is even eight years old but it was interesting and i'm going to update this we'll have to see how we've done but reported near mid-air collisions each year guess when four flight came out and i'm not blaming four flight but it's really the technology that goes along with it and when it actually was put onto the ipad was right around here and then look what happens related i don't know uh 82.3 percent of all statistics are made up on the spot so I don't know if these are 
related to four flight or not. And I don't know how we've done since, but we're going to look into that and, and I'll let you know. But I think it's interesting that uh, near midair collisions went back up after people are getting their heads down. So in this warning, <clears throat> I really want to admonish that you don't keep your heads down too much. I'm going to say that a lot. I say it to my students a lot. You should too, if you're a flight instructor. Um, in this case, um, there was a Beechcraft pilot on January 16, 2004, a Cessna 180 and a Beach Baron collided uh, in Southern California. And uh, the beach was in, cru in a cruise climb and his altitude was like 5,500 feet above sea level, but less than 6,500 feet above sea level. And less than a second prior to the collision, he observed the right landing gear of an approaching airplane in his one o'clock position. He then ducked in a reflex-like manner and the collision occurred. The beach pilot observed a dirt airstrip near his location and made a precautionary landing. And this is a picture of his airplane after that landing gear went through. And could you just imagine if that was on the other side of the airplane? Um, and I'm not saying this was a heads down situation either. I just wanna be very clear about pushing hard to avoid uh, mid-air collisions. It's, it scares me and it's something that I think a lot of people take for granted. A lot of pilots get comfortable, big sky, small airplane, what could possibly go wrong? So four flights constantly updating itself. Here's a brief video of, here's all the new things in four flight. If you just wanna take a look at this real quick, this is just the newest, latest, greatest uh, features in four flight. All right, I think we got that. That's how often uh, about that much changes. It kind of seems like it, but also, uh, beware updating your iOS for flight subscribe to their email or their blog and be sure that you get these warnings that whenever there's a new iOS that comes out they'll tell you that they're currently performing testing and you get the all clear once they've determined that it works because the last thing you want to do is expect to go flying and navigate and use for flight and get out there and you just I updated your iOS the night before uh, and the new, the latest version of ForeFlight doesn't work with it. So we want to be very careful about that. So, um, Mike, can you launch poll number three and see what you all think about this? Can ForeFlight replace paper charts? Of course, the answer is right there in the slide. So let's just see who's paying attention. And as we're populating the results of this, I will go over some of the uh, requirements. So there's an advisory circular that talks about personal electronic devices and electronic flight bags. So FAR 91-121 and advisory circular 91-21, and these documents can be found, I'm not gonna read them to you. Uh, they can be found on the Four Flight Workshops website. There's a link to them there. And the advisory circular 91-78 on the electronic flight bag. What they basically say is it can't interfere with your avionics and it must be determined by the PIC that when you're using it, uh, nothing bad happens, that there's no interference. One time while flying with um, a friend of mine, we were flying along one way, everything worked fine. My iPad was kind of weak, so I plugged in an external battery and on the way back, all of a sudden there's nothing but static over the radio. And it took a while to figure it out, but I did realize that it was the battery by unplugging the battery from the iPad, all of a sudden the radios got fine again. So you wanted to check on the ground, check all your radios and avionics and make sure it doesn't interfere. The EFB can be used under part 91. We can use it VFR and IFR. It's a legal replacement for paper charts, but uh, the functional equivalent has to be, uh, it is a functional, it has to be a functional equivalent of the paper charts. The data must be current the, especially data you're on, on which you're relying. And um, there should be an evaluation period recommended by the advisory circular that you just um, try this uh, EFB while still carrying the paperwork just to make sure that everything works and that you can access it the way that you plan. So we got most people paying attention. A couple of 10% didn't uh, answer the legality question. And about 50-50 looks like sharing uh, or still carrying paper charts. I carry paper charts because it makes a great sunscreen. Uh, no, I'm, asked, I'm just old school. I get insecure. I think this, I've had my iPad overheat before. 
uh, battery didn't last as long as I thought, or something happened. I just feel good having a, a paper chart along with me for wherever I'm going. And I will go over the front end slides again uh, that we missed when I wasn't sharing my screen. Again, the GPS position capabilities are not a source for primary navigation for IFR. It's great information. It's wonderful to have a chart with the UR here. Uh, constantly moving, you know, having your geo reference position moving along the map. I think it really helps with avoiding airspace, knowing exactly where we are. Uh, but again, for IFR, it's not for navigation. You cannot legally use it. You need an approved IFR GPS for uh, flying uh, under IFR. Um, a backup is suggested. A second iPad or your iPhone can serve as a backup or even printing paper charts. Um, hey, Brian, do you want to take a look at the poll results here? Should we uh, share them with the crowd? Uh, can you? I just closed it. I thought I shared them and they didn't populate. Go ahead. Yeah, I got a, I had a share button that show up on mine. I just thought it was kind of interesting. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so they should be shared here. Um, most of us are pretty sure it can be used, but what was interesting to me is how many still carry paper charts. Not quite half now. Yeah, it's more I than I thought. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. The um, different program plans that you can get for ForeFlight. I'm going to talk about that briefly because it's going to come up a lot as we discuss. And if you're beginning, so there's basically there's basic pro and performance. They put the word plus after each of them. Uh, so I just eliminate the common denominator, which is the word plus and just say basic pro and performance. So basic here are all the features that you're going to get with basic and I'm not going to go over them, but there's going to be a chant time when I talk about a feature and show it off on my iPad. And then someone's going to say, my iPad doesn't have that. And we're going to come back and look at this and we're going to see, well, for flight is going to charge you more for that feature because that is on the plus plan. Or if you pay for their performance plan, uh, instead of the pro plan, it shows you everything is included on the uh, performance plan. So it, it shows you here and there's a link to this on the website as well. And if it comes up where we're looking for, Hey, what plan covers this feature? We'll come back to the slide. Um, I also want to caution, pilots not to get overly reliant on technology. Uh, as the autopilots got better and better, we see more pilots becoming autopilot junkies using the autopilot as a crutch instead of as a tool. It's a great tool, but all the automation is a great tool if you use it properly. Just go get too reliant on the automation. Something like that could happen. And we don't like that. Get the blue screen. I think that's mixing Windows and Apple, but that's okay. You get the idea. Um, and here's another good example of technology failure. Whoa, that's not good. Oh, I don't need this. I'm already late. Somebody will come. Anybody out there? Do you have a phone? No. Sorry. Somebody! Oops. Sorry. Hello! Anyway, I think you get the idea. There are two I don't know people if ever stuck been on stuck an escalator. On an escalator before, but that's really being a little bit too reliant on automation. Uh, as far as a weather briefing, yes, you can get an official weather briefing on there, but I'm interested in what everybody's doing nowadays. I've taken this poll before. I'd like to see now, and if you could launch poll five, Mike, we'll take a look and see where do you get your weather briefing? It's on the way. There we go. Uh, and, and all of these sources are legal. Uh, again, you need to tie your end number to your briefing, and ForeFlight does a great job of, of doing that. And it looks like as these are coming in a preponderance, uh, people use the ForeFlight for the, for the briefing, but I hope you're using it correctly and getting everything out of it that you can and should, and not just uh, downloading it and saving it and moving on. Uh, looks like they're still coming in. There are different formats in ForeFlight as well. We're going to talk about that because you might see a different format on your flight instructors briefing as you see on yours. 
And we'll talk a little bit about that later, probably in a more advanced course on how to change things like that. I'm gonna go ahead and end this one and we'll share the results. So most people are using ForeFlight to, to, uh, to get their briefings. 1-800-WX website and telephone are the next and ForeFlight on the web. Surprisingly, not many people are doing that. ForeFlight recently put a poll out that made me think they're gonna get rid of their ForeFlight on the web or at least reduce some of the features of it. I don't know if anybody out there saw that, but hopefully they don't. I like to use it. It's good if you're sitting at your PC and I have a link to that as well. But you can go to the ForeFlight on the web and do your flight planning there and it'll wind up syncing with your iPad as well, which is pretty cool. When I took this uh, poll a while ago, it, uh, these were the results, which is very similar to what we got now, it looks like. I'm gonna stop sharing. You know, it looks like more people have gotten over to ForeFlight, both the on the web and the mobile version, and almost 60% now between the two of them. Yeah, yeah, and I'm glad it's good to see that because it's so convenient. Um, let's try one more poll question, number one. What is your experience level? And I just want to get an idea to, to whom we're talking tonight. How, what's the experience level of the general consensus of everybody here? As we're looking at the results come in, I was surprised to see that it spiked with I've never used it before and then that kind of changed. So my guess is those who've never used it for are faster at answering and reading polls. Yeah, I noticed that too. I was wondering what that was about. That <laughs> like, was oh, interesting. We're gonna have a lot of people who've never <laughs> used it. There are yeah, for one horrible moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A room full of newbies here. That's awesome. <laughs> right. right. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and we'll share the results here. Looks like most everybody would consider themselves intermediate. We got quite a few experts and I plan on hearing from you guys and I wanna hear some uh, tips and tricks that you've got. I, I watch, I try to attend four flight seminars and webinars online and watch and I, while I consider myself relative and ex, a relative expert, I still get quite a bit. I always seem to learn something. And uh, in the event, we're gonna try to cater from the very beginning all the way to the more advanced and counting on those of you who are with us as experts to help us uh, teach this and come up with some good tips and tricks. There's more than one way to do almost everything on the app. And I like to do it with less keystrokes. I like to go as, do as less work as possible because I'm lazy. And so I, I like to try to find the shortest way to do something. And I'm inclined to click expert. On the other hand, every time I think I'm getting to the expert level, they come out with a new version and it resets me back down. I got to relearn the whole thing again. Yeah, I'd say it looks like a heartbeat blip where I'm up, then down, up, then down. And uh, every time they come out with wonderful new features, like they just came out with some great new features that we'll uh, probably get a chance to look at in a little bit. Yeah, the, the funniest thing, Brian, you said in a long time what, to uh, some folks at ForeFlight was, I wish, I wish you'd stop the nerds from doing stuff for a while. <laughs> yeah, I called uh, Master Tyson Ways, who developed ForeFlight, great guy. And I said, hey, can you please have your nerds just give them six months off for us? So yeah, so we could catch up, exactly. Um, if you haven't bought an iPad or you're considering buying another one, obviously the size of it, the physical size is dependent on your airplane. Uh, you know, I have a two-seat Citabria and uh, up front there's not a lot of room, but we have a big bar we can clamp it to with a, a mount and get it up over our head and out of our way. It's great. Uh, I was flying a 182 and I don't, I have a 11 inch, you know, iPad air and I have nowhere to put it. I, I can't put it anywhere that will block the window or the flight controls. And so that was my biggest problem. Where do I put it? Well, the lap is where I ended up settling on with that. But so check it out, try different sizes, uh, maybe cut a piece of cardboard to fit to the specs that the iPad you're considering and take it out to your airplane and see what uh, what works best. And if you can find a way to mount it and put it in there. Um, I would get as much memory as you can. I always suggest if you can afford it, uh, a year or two from now, you won't miss the extra 100 or $200 it took to buy extra memory, but you'll be glad you have the memory. I, I bought as big a hard drive as I could for the iPad and I downloaded the whole country. I've always got everything on board. I get every chart, every plate, uh, Jeppesen and government charts and I have the whole uh, the high resolution the entire US and I have enough room for that but if you don't want to spend that much 128 gigabytes minimum to fit 
as much as you can on there. Uh, you want to be real careful about uh, using all your memory. And then when you go get an update, it gets stuck because it can't update it. Uh, so there's tips there. So don't update until like if you don't have enough memory on your iPad to, to, to hold the next update and the current one, don't do it until the, the one expires. And hopefully you're in a position on the day where it changes over to delete all the data that you have on there and then download the new one after that. Otherwise, you just get what you need as you need it. But the risk is that you might take off without something on board. So when you do your flight planning on there, you'll get a little pack button with a notification. We'll talk about that later uh, that will tell you, hey, you're missing some things for this route of flight. Also, uh, yeah, watch out for that. You don't want to get that storage almost full uh, and it'll help you manage by down, you know, getting rid of some other maps and charts that you don't use. So some iPadology, you, some iPads, the older ones have the home button, you'd push it. Uh, now we don't have the home button, it's just a single swipe from the bottom uh, and swipe it up from the bottom and that opens up all the apps that are open, a window, and then you can close them from there by swiping them up. So that's how, that's the new home button is swiping up from the bottom. Um, where are we at? The screenshot you can take with, it depends on the iPad you have. Uh, if you have a home button and a power button, you hit them at the same time, takes a screenshot. It's a great feature because you can take a screenshot of a checklist and then have it in your photos and then go back and forth or so on. The new one, it's the power and the volume up is the uh, screenshot button. So learn how to do that. Uh, closing unused apps is important because you might have a lot of apps open. I hope uh, some people with their iPads that's just running slow and not performing like they'd like. Do the swipe up from the bottom, just swipe up and stop and then lift your finger off and it'll, you'll see all the apps that are open and then just swipe them up and close. And most of you probably know that, but you want to hard close the apps you're not using. Uh, and then there's a four finger swipe. There's a three finger swipe and they do different things. Try them. That's taking three fingers on the screen and swiping left and right or four fingers on the screen. And that's how you switch between apps that are open is a four finger swipe across the screen. And it's like a back button, so you go back with it. Uh, it's not necessarily left and right. The control center is something we're going to refer to quite a bit, and it's on the top of the iPad, uh, like where the clock and the battery percentage is. If you just start on the top right edge corner, the top edge, and swipe down, you'll open up the control center, kind of, and that's where you have a lot of. You can update what's in there. You can modify it and customize it. Uh, but we're going to be going there several times, and we'll show you that. A hard reset uh, is usually the volume down on the power button. Hold it until the screen goes black. Or actually, if you do that on the newer iPads, it might call 911. So you want to be careful about that. Uh, know how to hard restart it. Usually it's the volume down and the uh, power button. And you'll see a turn off. You can swipe to turn it off. Uh, but sometimes if it's totally locked up, then you're to hold those two for as long as it takes till you see the Apple logo. And usually that could be like 30 seconds to a minute. The apps folders, you can put certain apps and folders and combine them and organize it and make it a lot easier. The apps that you use all the time, you can dock them to the bottom. Uh, there's a lot of touchology. There's swiping, there's tapping, there's touching, there's touching and holding. And we're going to refer to those different types of things as we move along here because they do different things with the iPad. You can go landscape and portrait. Landscape is when it's wider than it is tall. Portrait's when it's taller than it is wide. And you can, you know, the iPad, whichever way you turn it will adjust in four flight, but you're going to, you know, have times where you might want to lock it. For example, you've got your iPad mounted to your yoke and you're flying through turbulence and the map keeps rotating every time you move the control wheel. Uh, so you can actually lock it. And we'll talk about that as well. Uh, and that's in the control center. The older iPads have a physical switch. Uh, the newer ones, it's just a, a soft switch in the control center. By soft switch, I mean it's something you tap on the screen for. A hard switch is something that actually moves on the side of the iPad. The inverted night mode, uh, you can put it in night mode two ways, either the iPad settings or in the app. So in the app is where ForeFlight recommends doing it and you can actually dim it from there and change the uh, dark, in the dark mode for nighttime, which is better, it uses up a lot less battery, uh, but also a triple click. You can set your home button so that a, the, the power button, clicking it three times will actually invert the colors. 
You want to be careful about that reading sectionals and charts and stuff because the colors won't be right. Uh, but inverted or the night mode works great. Caution to be sure to look at it not in night mode when you're doing something near terrain or a sit or a star so that you can actually see uh, the right colors on there. The Private location services need to be on if you don't get your own like you are here uh, and that's in the settings and privacy location services and you want to make sure and turn that on and you can look at every app that's using your location, maybe turn most of them off unless you want it to know your location and ForeFlight is certainly one that you would want to know your location and sometimes it's always and sometimes it's when using. I prefer to set it when using that way when I'm not using the app, the app is not working in the background to figure out where I am. Uh, allowing notifications for flight has a lot of notifications, so you want to be sure that it is set to give you your notifications. So again settings find the for flight app and allow notifications and we're going to go through a lot of this actually on the iPad so while i'm going quick and uh, and scrolling through a lot of this you're going to see it as well on the iPad when we get to that. The uh, what have I got here? I've got uh, oh in your notifications. You can decide how they look. They can be a banner. They can be sounds. You can turn them on and off, uh, and, and you can see where I, this is in the settings. Scroll down to four flight. I've got set right here. Tapped on that, and these are the specific settings for four flight. You'll want them on. Um, I like to announce as well because when you file a flight plan. IFR, when your clearance is up, sometimes you'll get that, you'll get a notification. If you've gotten a briefing already, uh, it will notify you if significant changes have happened since you've received your briefing, which is, I think, a wonderful feature. Uh, let's see. Airplane mode uh, in the later iOSs, it might disable your Wi-Fi and Bluetooth on older iPads uh, right now, and it'll always leave your GPS on. But when you go to airplane mode now, it's going to just turn off the cellular phone basically because everything that we have we have in cockpit use of wi-fi and bluetooth connectivity uh, so it, it doesn't turn all that off right now if you have a newer ipad with the newer ios which you need to run for flight airplane mode will only turn off the cellular data with power and charging um, if you put it in airplane mode if you realize oh i didn't charge my ipad last night uh, I want to charge it as quickly as I can. Put it in airplane mode, turn off the Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth, all the radios. And, and the, we call it radio management, so be sure you turn off unnecessary radios if you're not going to be using Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, because you can use one of those or both to connect to your avionics in some airplanes. Uh, and also to uh, an ADS-B, for example, you may use. So leave on what you need, but turn off what you don't need. Always have a backup battery, an external battery. Uh, if your airplane has a cigarette lighter, have an adapter, but be very careful that if you have an airplane with a 28 volt system, uh, I've heard of people frying their iPads or their chargers because they plug it into that. It's not made for, or get a special adapter that, that checks it back down to 14 volts, 12 volts. These built-in USB chargers are, are wonderful. I put in a mid-continent clock that has USB chargers on it in my airplane, and it's great because it, it really just opens up how long you can use your electronic device. Watch out for polarized sunglasses. You'll think your iPad's broken. You're going to look through your polarized sunglasses and see my iPad's not coming on. If you ever see that, take those glasses off and, and double check and make sure that's not what it is. Uh, how does the iPad receive internet and data? Well, we have wireless internet. That's Wi-Fi, and that's the symbol. We got Bluetooth. It's good for close range, like communicating with your um, avionics or with other iPads or other devices. It's got cellular data that receives a cell phone signal. Of course, it needs to be near a cell antenna to receive that. And usually relatively low, you get up above eight or 9,000 feet. A lot of times that won't work. Depends on where you are. Um, the position is obtained by an internal GPS, which is assisted by the cellular. So when you first turn on for flight, maybe leave it on the cellular data while it's acquiring its position and then turn it off. Uh, and again, airplane mode used to turn off cellular and blue. It turns off cellular, but not all the radio. So it leaves the Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth. It used to turn off everything, but leave the GPS on. The GPS will always be on and it'll find your position initially better with cellular turned on. If you're looking at what iPad to purchase also, you'll want to get one if you don't have one yet with cellular 
capability, even if you don't activate that sale or service, you want to get one capable because that will also include a GPS, an internal GPS. The internal GPS has worked great, but it has to be an iPad that's cellular capable. You're going to wind up say, activating the cellular anyway because you can file flight plans, get weather briefings, update your flight planning, update winds. Everything can be done right there at the airplane with that. And I just saw a new Garmin uh, announcement of their plane sync. And I don't know if you've seen that yet. That looks really cool. Uh, but anyway, leave the GPS on. If you have one with cellular capability, you'll have a GPS. So that position is either obtained by the internal GPS. And again, if your iPad has cellular capability, it has a GPS. Or you can get an external GPS. These are usually more powerful. You can locate them right by the window so they get a better view of the sky. And then they'll connect to the iPad with either Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. And usually you can connect with more than one device. You can use the signal. But that'll also give you uh, AHARS, Attitude Heading and Reference System, which is going to give you attitude and heading, just like the name says, which is really cool. You lose all your flight instruments. You've got some emergency backup there. Uh, I wouldn't recommend using that, however, unless you've tried it first and see how it works and, and get yourself a little comfort with that. But it also gets ADSB in traffic and weather. It doesn't update nearly as quickly with the weather as it does the traffic, but it gives you near real-time traffic information, which is wonderful. Again, you need to see it out the window, uh, not on the iPad. And a lot of times the traffic you see on the iPad is there, but so is the traffic you don't see on the iPad. That traffic is also there because not everybody shows up on there uh, for reasons we can get into later. So enough about the iPad. Let's take a look at the core features of the app, the core uh, tabs. Let's see, what are we doing on time? About 45 minutes into it. We'll take a break shortly here just to regroup a restroom and, and so on. But, and then we'll come back and look at the real iPad. We have eight core tabs. They're always visible. Uh, we can change tab buttons. On the, the, I'm sorry, one of them is a change tab button, which is this one right here, will always usually be the last app that you, or last mode that you use from the settings on the more tab. And the more tab on the far right brings open the, uh, the menu. And from there we can get our settings. And, uh, oh, didn't do it. Let me go back. We'll get our settings and we're gonna talk about more settings and setup later. Um, and you can also edit the order of all those extras on there, like weight and balance, the passengers, the devices, setting up your aircraft, logbook, all that stuff, uh, your account information. You can resort that menu right there to how you want. But the last one you used is what's going to show up right here where the uh, logbook is right now. ForeFlight has a ton of advisors, and they call them advisors, the root advisor, uh, where you can find published routes and, and, re and clearance routes that have been cleared before or recommended routes. I understand that ForeFlight's recommended routes, when you, you tap on it, and we'll see this, uh, are about 75 to 80% cleared as filed if you use ForeFlight's recommended routes, and they're getting more and more accurate as time goes on. The altitude advisor to show you where the weather, the turbulence, and terrain and airspace, it shows you all that in a profile. A procedure advisor, which helps you determine which arrival you're going to use or which pattern you're going to fly. If you're hooked up to cellular, it's getting the current winds at the airport. And it'll show you which runway is best for the current winds. Anyway, it's got all these advisors, hazards, cabin altitude, a glide advisor, a spouse advisor. Oh, no, I don't think it has that. I don't know who typed that. <laughs> um, as you approach an airport, for example, there's it'll tell you, hey, you're approaching. Here's the Dallas Digitalatus frequency. So you can tune that in uh, and, it, and it does that at a certain time uh, to the destination. That'll just pop up. And then I had a student one time who had that on there and he didn't know how to get rid of it. And I said, read it. And he says, it says ATIS is 123.77. I said, read the small print and it says tap to hide. Well, that's how you hide it. I, I'm guessing. I don't know that. But tap to hide, I'm thinking, is going to get rid of it. Uh, also flying along, you may have noticed it gives you the nearest altimeter setting. It, you have to turn these features on and we'll go make sure those are turned on in your settings. But while you're flying along and it gets a new altimeter setting, it's going to pop up and tell you about it. And again, tap to hide that. 
uh, has a lot of audio and visual alert systems. It uses the GPS. Uh, the GPS is available to all subscribers and it runs automatically in the background. I mean, this service, uh, the knowing where you are on the ground and telling you, hey, you're approaching a runway or you've entered a runway. Those are the features that are available to everybody because that's a safety issue. I mean, taxiing around airports has become uh, so easy now because of that. The uh, other feature that a lot of people say, they, they plan a long flight and they accidentally deleted the flight plan or they wound up taking a fix out and it gets rid of everything they did. Well, the oops button is uh, to go to use a look at the history. It's always recording your history. And this is a great trick because uh, if you go back and look at the routes and you look for this button here with a clock on it, anytime you see that, that's time related, so history. Um, you can save a route to favorites if you want with that button right there, little star, you make the star yellow, you save a route, you can save an airport, but the stars are favorites. And then you recall an old route that you accidentally deleted with the favorites button or with the history button. If you go to history, you'll go back and see all the flight plans you've had and you can bring it back up with that. So it's kind of like an undo, uh, a little backwards way to undo. In the route editor, this button with the box with an arrow coming out of it, we're going to call it the send to button. It's what it is. It's how you send things to places. And you're going to hear me say that a lot, send to. Um, and then you can take a flight plan and send it to flights, for example, and that's where you get your full briefing or file a flight plan. You can take a chart and send it to the uh, map. You can take a, uh, a plate and send it to the map. You can take a plate and send, you can send things to the printer if you want to print things, if you have an air printer. And then of course, file to file a flight plan. Um, once you've, uh, I've created a flight plan, for example, and this is just a simple one. You'll see a lot of the red balls. When you see red balls, uh, I like to clear them up as soon as I can, but this is one on the pack button. So you know that because it's a suitcase. When you see it there, it means you're missing some information that you need for the flight that you've planned. It will download anything needed for any state. It'll get the whole state that touches a 25 mile or 50 mile corridor. Uh, 25 miles on each side of your flight or 50 mile radius around your airplane is going to get everything you need for, for that distance. The, uh, it, it will only pack types of charts that you've specified that you want to download. So when we go through the settings together, uh, you have to choose what thing, what features you want. Do you, I, don't, I don't want terminal procedures or IFR because I'm a VFR pilot, so I have those unselected. When you do the pack, it will not download those features which you just chose not to download. On the uh, to get a briefing, we go to the flight tab. We're going to go through this on the iPad, so I'm going to kind of scroll through a little faster. But you can get these notifications: Hey, your your flight's been accepted, um, your filing succeeded, your flight plan was filed, and then you can actually open your. If it's a VFR flight plan, you can open it. You'll get notifications if you get if new TFRs pop up since you got your briefing, uh, new airmits, new sigmits. Uh, it'll get a notification and you'll get the alerts on, on ForeFlight. That's why you want to be sure and enable the alerts. Because there's a lot of good ones. And once again, after filing, you can cancel a flight plan. You can amend it, uh, discard changes, file changes, and you can also open and close VFR flight plans. I'm up to tips and tricks. What do you think, guys? You want to break out? Got any questions yet you want to answer? Or do you want to take a short, brief break? We're at uh, 53 minutes into it. We've got a couple that we probably need to answer here pretty quick. One that's been pretty hot and spicy in the Q&A there is about DPEs allowing the use of iPads on check rides. Do you want to tackle that one? Sure. I know that DPEs will allow it. It is a tool that you use, but if you have it, you better know how to use it. And it's okay to use it. And you need to know how the information was derived. Like a good question would be, yeah, I plan a flight from A to B. I look at the four flight uh, nav log and it says I'm to fly because it knows the winds. It says I'm to fly a heading of 263 degrees magnetic. Well, an examiner might say, how did four flight derive that 263? We, they just want to know if you understand how it's calculating the information it's giving you. They want to know that you're a master of it and they might take it from you at any time and say your iPad just failed. You want to be ready for that. So that said, yes, you can use it. Yes, you, it's a great tool for planning. Everybody knows you're going to use it after you get your uh, certificate or rating. 
So it's important that you know how to use it well. Uh, so you'll be tested on it and, and it, you have to be prepared for it to fail. Have a backup. So what do you do if you get a DPE who says, I'm not going to allow you to use an iPad on a check ride? Well, I think that's important for an instructor to determine what, I mean, wherever they're going to send their applicants to determine what that DPE allows and then decide if they want to teach that way. Um, if, if I was teaching in a way where I want my, my students to be able to use the, the four flight and the, and the electronic flight plan and the EFB, I do that, but I start them out on paper. They know how to use that. Uh, I'll tell the student, hey, are you good with doing it that way or do you want to use four flight? If you want to use four flight and be able to have a backup paperwork and, know, and you know how it works, and you want to find a designated examiner that does that, that's what I would do is find a designated examiner who would allow you to use it. I understand that nowadays, you're almost forced to take whoever's available within the next six months. Yeah, that's a fact. And I, I'm just looking in the, uh, the private pilot airman certification standards. Uh, it's on uh, in Appendix A on page 19 is where it says, if the applicant is trained using a portable EFB to display charts and data and wishes to use the EFB during the practical test, the applicant is expected to demonstrate appropriate knowledge, risk management, and skill. So in other words, work it into all the questions on every uh, task in every area of operation that you're quizzed on during the program. And um, so, right. yeah, exactly what you said. You got to know how to do it. I have not seen any DPAs who refuse to accept it. And I, I, I was I under the either. impression that they're required to accept it, though I don't see that language in here. Yeah, I don't know. I've never seen that they're required to accept it, but every DPE may have a different way of doing things. And I don't want to say it's wrong, but if I think it's incumbent upon the instructor to talk to the DPE and decide if that's for their student or not. Sure. If I, if, yeah. if I may, the DPEs in my part of the world uniformly say, not a problem, but if there's only one device on, working on the airplane, that is, you don't have a backup, it could be an interesting ride at that point. <laughs> exactly exactly and if you have an iphone it works as a great backup a second ipad or paper absolutely yep. okay we had a couple of questions about ipad mounts uh, and a couple of aspects of that one uh, one user or uh, attendee commented that um, make sure that you don't interfere with any controls you want yeah. to talk about how they did that at work when they first introduced ipad 10 years ago yeah um you mean at a, where we where we work? Yeah, yeah. I think that's important. Uh, it needs to be out of the way so it doesn't interfere with avionics. It shouldn't block your obscure your view out the window, and it shouldn't interfere with any flight controls. Um, I'm I'm not as familiar with you are as what they did at work to to, to handle that. But mm -hmm. I mean, we what what are you referring to? Yeah, when you install the iPad, whatever kind of a mount you use, whether you use a, a, a yoke mounted, a yoke mount, I'll talk about that again in a second, or a floor mount or a window mount, exercise the flight controls all the way through the, the, the full, you know, box the controls and make sure nothing gets interfered with. Well, and that's what I was going to say as well. Yeah, box them all the way left, back, all the way right, all the way forward. And that was the problem I had in a 182. You have a 182, Mike. I don't know where you put yep. yours. I'd like to hear because I couldn't find anywhere to put a standard size iPad in a 182 other than just on my knee. Yeah, I tucked mine in the, the side pocket. Um, but the thing about it, uh, mounting it on the yoke that I don't like is it changes the balance of the ailerons. As you turn the ailerons left or right, it's, now you've got a weight on that control that's affecting the way it feels. And to me, I never like that. It's yeah. just a bad idea. I don't like it either. And I gave a flight review not long ago. And the first thing the uh, <laughs> pilot I flew with did was put the iPad up on the suction. It was a RAM mount that suctions to the window. And if you look at how much of your view that subtends when you're talking about, you know, if you put your hand really close to your eyes, you can see how much of your view it blocks. Well, the closer it is to you, the more it's blocking. And I didn't like that for collision avoidance. And I said, I'm not going to, we're not going to complete this flight review because I'm not going to sign you off on collision avoidance if you obscure your view. So we had to find a different thing to do. I like the articulating arm from, I think it's my go flight with a suction cup that can go in the corner. And then it's got that arm with a couple elbows and you can put it wherever you want, tighten it and it stays there. That's I like for a fixed position. I like a knee board. Um, and uh, Jason Miller told me about this one the other day and I can't remember the name of it, but it is a strap that goes around your leg and it's got a clamp. The iPad mount itself hooks onto that clamp 
and then you can easily grab it, pick it up, take it off, or snap it back onto your leg. That I think will work in most airplanes. That's good for instructors that are switching to a lot of different airplanes as well. Most of the time, like we flew with kneeboards, clipboards sitting on our lap, that works quite well in most airplanes. And an iPad mini, you know, I flew Learjets. We couldn't, there was nowhere in the cockpit to use a regular sized iPad. So we had to use iPad minis. Yeah, one of the things about the the uh, suction cup mounts on the windows, especially for a non-pressurized airplane, remember as you climb, the ambient pressure decreases. So now the difference between what's inside the suction cup and what's in the cockpit is getting Pop. smaller. And as you climb up, they fall off. Yeah, and we had a rash of, uh, uh, of iPad mounts, the RAM mounts stuck to the window falling off as you climb. Now that's the higher you go, the, the cabin altitude, the higher the cabin altitude is, the more of a problem you're going to have with that. And I remember we actually had a procedure for iPad falling off <laughs> up the window. Yeah. Just, iPad dismount procedure, please. Yeah, and, and, and the last step on that is buy a new iPad because you just spidered the screen when it hits something. And... <laughs> right, right. Yeah. We've been going um, and now, an hour. What about, about a short break? Are you have okay. another question? Uh, well, one more that's kind of related to this is how about cooling mounts? Does that affect the cooling issue? Absolutely. Yeah. If you're in a hot area, and I'm in Dallas, so it doesn't get hot here. We don't need anything like that. <laughs> or you, <laughs> you yeah. don't have air conditioning. Uh, I, I have friends who have used that. I've used one before. I've had iPad iPads overheat. Absolutely. If you're flying somewhere where you're in the cockpit, if you're flying somewhere where you open the door and leave it open while you're taxiing, you probably need an iPad cooler. If you put your iPad up on the glare shield, even in cool weather, but in the sun, you're going to get an iPad overheat. And there's no, no worse feeling than you're relying on that iPad and you pick it up and it says iPad will turn back on when it cools down to a reasonable temperature. Or it says overheat yep. on it. Happened to me. I put iPad and iPhone on the right hand seat on an empty leg out of Kanab, Utah one time and turned for home and went down and they were both overheated. Yeah, very scary. <laughs> so yes, idea. those um, to answer that question, yes, they are great. Uh and, and and I would recommend it if you're in any kind of warmer climate. Yeah. And let me add let, if I may add to that, uh gentlemen um gentlemen. Um don't leave the Try to keep the iPad in a shady spot in the cockpit as much as possible, down below the glare shield, that kind of thing. I've had it. I've had an iPad overheat on a on a five degree day. Wow! Yeah, sun. great advice. It's the greenhouse effect in a in a if it's sitting in the sun, and it's it's been when it's charging, it'll overheat too because you're really heating it up the battery when you're charging it. You, in, even if it's sitting in the shade, that can happen. Also, I believe there's a limitation. There's a ten thousand foot altitude restriction on iPad. I don't know if anybody knew that. Uh, you, were you aware of that, Mike? I remember that when it, there was a big question just about the time we started getting them at work. And I don't remember all the details out of it. I haven't heard about that lately. Something to consider. Yeah. Anyway, let's take a short break and we'll come back, resume with this, and we'll get on the real iPad and play around with that as well. Uh, take some more questions and, and see what we got going on. When you see, if you're a red ball Nazi like I am, no jokes, please. I know that they're going to come in the chat, but. I see a red ball, I got to do something with it. And, and I just need to update as soon as possible. A lot, a lot of people aren't like that. Um, <laughs> my wife has 1,562 unread emails. I have zero, I go through them. I see a red ball, I got to do the update. I can't help it. Caution, don't do it unless you have time to check and make sure it works before flight. Don't do your uh, uh, iOS update until four flight says you, you can, unless you have another device. Uh, so there are iOS updates, and you'll see that red ball on the gear tab for the iPad settings there, and, and you'll get this message from ForeFlight if you subscribe to their blog, and I would highly advise that, of when it's okay to update the iOS. Uh, they'll tell you, hey, here it is, and this is an old one, obviously, but hey, you're all clear. We're here. It says we're performing compatibility testing. You can also get notifications on your iPhone. And you'll get the all clear it says okay this ios is all cleared for use and you want to watch for that before updating or you'll get the email that compatibility testing is complete and it's all good again send to button hey, uh, hey uh, brian one more question very closely related to that a couple of people asked about conditional all clear the, the current version says a conditional all clear on ios i think it was 16.4.1 I didn't and actually I, read it. I just, and that may be a lesson learned, but I just went and updated. I saw 
all clear, so I went and did it. Um, what was the condition? Do you know? It, uh, no, it wasn't clear in that message from ForeFlight, and I just went to the ForeFlight website and tried to research this a little bit, and I saw no further details on what that conditional all clear meant. So if somebody knows, if you would drop that into the, the Q&A there, uh, I, we'd really appreciate that. We'll make sure we flag that next time around. Excellent. And uh, I see someone, I saw a couple of questions about where is the history button. Uh, I, I think we maybe we just jump over to the iPad and start talking about that because I can show pictures of them here all day long, but I think it's nice to actually look at the iPad itself. Uh, but first, I think we, let's do some giveaways in case anybody needs to drop off. You've been on here long enough to uh, get your wings credit. And I also have, let's start with the, uh, the flight gear. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop the share here so you can see what I've got here. The flight gear, iPad mount, uh, bifold knee board. It, it works pretty well for almost any size iPad and it clips to your leg and everything. So we randomized our selection process and the first one is Doug Murray and if Doug if you are still here could you send a private or I guess uh, Michael reach out to you privately in the chat and uh, we'll get your address so we can send this to you thanks for showing I, up I see him still there and we should have his email address but um, yeah I'll send you a message Doug excellent and we'll get your address and you've got an iPad uh, lap lap chart holder so uh, Clipboard. So the uh, let's see. The next one we're going to give away is the one-year membership to NAFI. Of course, everybody here is probably already a member, so we're, we may have to go through a few names. James Ferris. James Ferris, if you're still here and you're not a NAFI member, you just earned a free uh, one-year membership, and you get the magazine. You get all kinds of discounts to Four Flight. If you buy uh, anything, NAFI is National Association of Flight Instructors, and we. Um, don't, you don't have to be a flight instructor to join. There are many benefits. We are uh, an organization trying to help instructors become better instructors and to help instructors teach. Uh, but we also have a lot of educational content, discounts at Sporties and rental cars and uh, of MCO. Uh, we have all kinds of special deals, a deal with ForeFlight as well. Uh, but you don't have to be an instructor to be a member or benefit from all of the wonderful things. Just go to nafinet.org and you can look it up. We'll be at AirVenture. I'll be organizing our, our presentations there. We'll have near, nearly 30 presentations. So if you're in Oshkosh, come by and say hello as well and say you are on the ForeFlight thing. Do we have uh, James Ferris? Hang on, I've got to unmute here. James is still showing as in the building. I okay. sent him a, a private chat just a All moment right. ago. Sounds good. We've got two more things to give away. A uh, one, actually a lifetime membership, lifetime subscription to the ground school at ground school. Uh, it's groundschool.com, uh, gold seal ground school. So either you, you can choose private or instrument and it's all of the ground school you need to pass and get a great score on the written test. Uh, and that will go to Melanie Walker. The first one, we have two. Is Melanie still here? Uh, she is also still showing in the house. Okay, so we have fine. a record of that and hopefully you get a hold of her. Yep. And I we will contact her and tell her how to get the free, uh, that's a $300 value to get the ground school for either come, uh, private or instrument. And one more recipient of the free uh, Gold Seal ground school is Robin Miller. Is Robin Miller in the house? And Robin is also still showing present. Excellent. If you have any trouble reaching out to them, let me know, and we'll we'll uh, we'll go to our backup numbers names here. But thank you guys. You'll love it, and we're going to give away two of those uh, ground schools from Gold Seal on every workshop. I say, let's just go to the iPad at this point. So let's just give gutsy me move, Maverick. Let's hit it. Say again. Gutsy move, Maverick. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Here we go. Let's see. What's the worst that could happen? <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? Takes just a second to make the switch over. And naturally, here it comes. Bear with me.
Okay, can we see my iPad? Yes. Okay, good. So again, the main tabs across the bottom here are fixed. You'll see a faint white line right here that shows the fixed tabs are on the left and the, the soft one or the multifunction one is right here. That's the last one you go to. And then the more is right here. So if I tap more, up here is where we manage our downloads and our settings. And if I were to go to logbook, for example, it now becomes the last one here. I may have had that before. If I go to account and close that, well, that didn't happen. Maybe just it's not a weight and balance. You can see it now replaced the, uh, the, the multifunction button, let's call it right there. So we'll go back to airports. And here's a favorite button. So I have an airport right here that's my favorite. It's yellow. That's how you can tell it's a favorite. If I deselect that, it leaves the favorites list here uh, on the airports. And you'll see favorites, recents. If you looked at one recently and you didn't save it as a favorite, you can look at the list of all the recent airports you've looked at, um, ones on the flights that you've used or that are on the map. And then you can just browse for any airport in the country by state as well, or globally, if you change it to globally down there at the bottom. We'll stay in the US. We'll go back to favorites. I'm going to take Denton here and re-favorite it. And since I've favored it, it's the last one I favored it, it will be the last one on the list. But I want that up top. That's where I rent from. My airplane is at a different airport, but I want this one up top. So just click edit up top. You can grab these when you see the three hamburgers stacked there. That means you can grab it right there and drag it up to where you want it. Although on my mouse pad, I can only go a little bit at a time. And so now it's up at the top. Nope, not quite. You can put them up there. Wow, I got a lot here. I have so many favorites. And then where I keep my airplane is at Hicks Field. So I'll just put that up here like that. And when okay, finished, so which one of your kids is your favorite? Yes. <laughs> the one that's with me or listening at the time. The way I describe it is if all of the airports are your favorite, then none of the airports are your favorite. Same thing with kids, right? Exactly. I tend to put the airports that are along my route of flight if I'm going to do that, because when I'm done editing, I'll hit done and you can see green is good. I can see I can get a pretty good weather briefing at the airports that I have selected here just by looking down and seeing the green. Of course, we'll get into more detail, but that's the initially how you do it. If you're out of town and you just want to say, I don't remember the name of the airport, but it's the one I'm at. It's the one I'm at the hotel and I'm nearest to that airport. Just come up here and you'll see this button here, which is your location it says show me the air a list of airports near me and that's what you're going to get and now you can see which airports are nearest me right now and then you can say all of them or just the ones that are reporting weather if i click all then i'm going to see everything that's near me or back to weather only if you see an airport near you like this one alliance fort worth airport and I want to put that on the map, I can select it while I'm looking at it. And I want to see where that is on the map. Well, this button here with a little map pin sitting on a map will go to the map and show you that airport. So I'm going to tap on that it's right here. It just centered it, highlighted it. There's the airport that I was just looking at. And I can zoom in on it and take a look. And you can see that it's giving some abbreviated information here. Uh, for flight also calls the chart supplement, which is the book formerly known as the airport facility directory. They call it an AFD still. So it says chart supplement AFD. You can actually see the AFD entry for that airport and you can zoom in on it. And you can actually remember I said the send to button, which is right here. Yeah, I can take that and send it to my printer because I like paper still. I like to have a paper backup. It makes me feel good. Ever since I started printing paper backup, my iPad doesn't overheat or fail. It's weird. You can go from this point and get weather, current weather, and it's, it's the METAR, and then also it gives it in English, plain English down below that, and it gives you nearby weather. If you hit the TAF, it'll give you the TAF in the conventional format, and you look below it, you can get it by time 7 p.m in case you can't do the the zulu conversion or don't want to uh, you can scroll down and look at that mos is model output statistics 
And I'm going to go back to, if I want to go back to full screen and not the map, I'm going to tap full screen right here. I can also add this airport to my route or go direct to it from present position from this point right here from this screen. I can also enter a holding pattern right there. But I want to go back to full screen. So I'm going to click on full screen and it's already favorited. But now I can see all the procedures here. Go back to information. All the frequencies are here. And you can go through that under the information, pattern altitude elevation, sunset and sunrise. So you know what time you need to land or if you can log nighttime or not. Remember there are three different kinds of nighttime, but we'll talk about that later too. Uh, elevation, pattern altitude, and notice next to pattern altitude, there's a little arrow. That means there's more. Well, pattern altitude for what kind of aircraft? And this begs the question, if I'm gonna be flying around in my airplane at 1723, and the turbines and heavies and this airport happens to serve as Amazon are going to be 500 feet above me in the pattern right here. Something to think about wake turbulence. Again, you can get the weather. And we were looking at that before. So the METAR, the TAF, model output statistics are computer models that give you a little bit more detail about the weather. Uh, again, it's they take the best of the computer modeling and put it together here and it goes out a little bit further. Uh, anything beyond 24 hours is just an estimated guess, <laughs> an educated guess. So don't track it too seriously unless it's within the next 24 hours or on the TAF. You can also click daily weather. This is a nice new feature where you can see everything and it has an aviation touch to it where it goes out, you know, for quite a while, 10 days, I think, or yeah, 10 days. And then you can actually look at details for example, if you clicked on tomorrow, we can look at the hourly by hour. So it gives you VFR, the ceiling, picture if you're better with pictures, uh, no ceiling tomorrow, the visibility will be 10. And we know that when they say 10, that means 10 or better, right? Because that's the most that they report in a forecast. The, and the winds, what they'll be, and you can look at them over time and you can slide along and see as it goes to the next day uh, as we're going here uh, and so on. So there's a lot of detail you can get. It also shows you how old that weather is. What we're looking at now is 13 minutes old. A lot of information in the airports, and we're going to come back to this. Basically, I want you to know how to use it, how to get to it now, how to create your favorites. Uh, if you have the pro plan, you can actually see a 3D view of the airport. Uh, you can select which runway you're going to look at. It shows you traffic there at the same time, and you can tilt it and look at it as well. Nice feature. Um, for, for looking at what you're going to fly into. Taxiways, of course, gives you the taxi diagram. Uh, someone asked where the favorites was. There's a history button right here. So we can look at all the stuff that I've looked at historically. I know I looked at something recently. I can find it on this list. You can clear that if you want. I'm going to close that for now. There's so much to show um, <laughs> and so little time. Uh, a new feature is taxi route. If, if uh, you know, to me, this is another heads down device, but you can put your taxi route in here like, you know, where are you starting? I'm starting at Alliance Aviation Services and I want to go to one six left and it shows you uh, the shortest route to there. But then you can start giving put your clearance in here and they might say alpha hold short of golf. And so you click alpha and hold short golf. I said golf and it'll look like that. And you can see what you're supposed to do. Just another feature, a newer one. And of course, while you're looking at that, any procedure, you'll see if there are notams that apply to the whole airport or to that procedure. Uh, very handy to have right there. This is an annotate. Whenever you see a pencil, you can annotate. Whenever you see a clock, it's history. When you see a gear, it's settings. Quick settings for what you're looking at right now. I'm gonna go ahead and close that for now. The next page and the most useful and the one we're gonna use the most is the map uh, tab. And that's where we look at, I hit direct too. So it went present position direct to the airport. By the way, while we're at it, another way to do that is just to type D space KAF. Actually, I'll do KLAX. That's present position where I am right now, direct to LAX and enter. And it's going to do that for me. It's just another little shortcut trick. And we're going to just be full of these as we go. So up here is the layers tab for the map, and there are all kinds of layers that you can choose what you want to look at, VFR, IFR. Maybe you want to just look at a street map because you know there's some place near a highway here. And then you want to put the aeronautical on, for example. And then you can see where the airports are. 
all of these are customizable. And so we want radar, we want to overlay that. But now I want to go back to my route. I want to see, okay, do I pinch and zoom or do I scan around for my route? There's a really cool button called zoom to route and it's this one right here. So if I'm zoomed in on something and I just want to show my full route, I tap that button and it just zooms to the appropriate level to center up your route right there. Really cool feature. Um, somebody asked in the chat, where's the history button? So if I'm looking at this, there's the layers. Right next to that is the flight plan drawer button. And you see I have a red ball exclamation point notifying me, hey, hey for that route, you're missing some information. So I tap that, it pulls down what we call the drawer, the flight planning drawer, and it is in the edit mode. And we have a ball next to the suitcase, which means I need to pack. And if I tap on it, you'll see, well, you're missing the weather notams, the updated fuel prices, airport notams along the way, and some 3D aerial imagery. That's not what is not normally downloaded. And if I hit the pack button, it'll download all that for this route. And you can see the corridor that it's using for that as well. We can do a lot of editing our route in here. This is a quick settings for the map. And these are some appropriate, if I ever say quick settings in the future workshop, I mean, going to this one here, these are the most commonly accessed features that you might wanna look at uh, is this quick settings button. Uh, this one that looks like an attitude indicator is exactly that. If you have an AHARS, you can get attitude information. Um, if you don't, then, uh, close the flight plan drawer, it'll say no attitude information, but it'll still give you your GPS ground speed, your GPS altitude, not real altitude, so don't rely on it for that. Remember, if it's hot to cold, you look out below or high to low, look out below, it's indicating higher than you really are. Your course will actually show up on here as well, and whether you're left or right. So it's got some handy, it's also showing that it was getting true. If I hook an AHARS up to this, you'll start getting attitude information right here. Of course, you can put this in full screen if you want. While you're looking at this, you can take a look around. I can tap and drag, and you can see the little button at the bottom is showing me that I'm looking to the right to my three o'clock. If I let go, you'll see a timer spinning around there. And when it gets back to the top, it's gonna go back to straight ahead view. And you can see that they're showing airports, obstacles, and everything in there. I'm going to go ahead and turn that off for now. It's an advanced feature we'll talk more about, but that's what this button does. Right here is the uh, instrument panel. It looks like an instrument, so that's the instrument panel. Tap on that, and it brings up your instrument panel down below, and it gives you all kinds of information, and you can set what it's giving you. Uh, these are the ones I happen to have in here right now. So my position to LAX is 1,063 miles. If I were moving, it would use my current ground speed to come up with an estimated time and route. It would show my ground speed. All these things that I can show you, you can choose what that is. Simply tap and hold one of these buttons and you can replace it with any of all of these things. So I tapped on the ETE to my next fix. Instead, let's say I want to show my climb gradient, uh, the actual climb gradient. I need to meet 300 feet per nautical mile. So I'm going to select that and it's going to show me what I'm doing right here. I just got already... a question on that, Brian. Yeah. Uh, somebody had asked, uh, how do you enable the altimeter pop up in ForeFlight? And I think this is probably what they're talking about, this, this instrument panel right here. And what I'm going to suggest is probably in a future episode, we'll talk about how you might arrange these. The number of numbers available is depends on the size of your screen and the orientation and some other things. Right. If I turn it sideways, you'll see there aren't as many available. Exactly. So I, we'll I think talk about that the, more in a, a future program. Absolutely. So you can get, I think the question was referring to the pop-up notification of the nearest altimeter setting. And I will answer that. Uh, first, I want to show that you can choose, one of the things you can choose here is nearest Barrow, and that'll pop up. It's probably going to go get the Alliance. That's the nearest altimeter setting. You can leave that up all the time. Or the notification that I showed on one of my slides is actually, uh, we would go to More and then to Settings. And I want to teach you how to find something in Settings because there's so much in here. If we just look at this, it just goes on forever. There's quite a bit. Um, you can click the filter. Let's say I'm looking to turn my own ship on and off. Don't go hunting for it and reading every line, just wrong keyboard. Just start typing own ship and it filters out the settings to what you're looking for. 
There's one on the map view, and then there's some in preferences. And in the map view, by the way, you can choose what your airplane looks like, depending on what you fly. They have all these new choices. Uh, pick what's cool and then pick which color you want. I have a high wing and I have blue. Back to the settings. So another thing about the settings is you'll notice the title of the section you're in sticks. So right now app theme, it only has one choice. I'm in light, you can go to dark if you won't prefer that look. And at night I would go dark. You can also have it follow your system. So whatever your system is doing at the time, you might have your iPad automatically switch to night mode. And if, if you have system selected, it'll follow that. Again, we're gonna spend hours looking at all this <laughs> in, the, in the coming workshops. But so we go through these, notice how the title of each section, so there's airport view, it sticks until they're gone. Weather view sticks until they're gone. But here's map view. Notice that it sticks right here, that's where I'm looking until I'm through with all of the map view section and then the next section will stick and so on. So it makes it easier to kind of find where you're looking um, and so on. Uh, there's just so much, there's no way we could, we could spend all night going through these, but as we have questions and we go through them, uh, we'll find them. But notifications is the one that somebody was asking about. Uh, actually that's in the, I thought it was notifications, but I started typing it and didn't see it. Maybe it's an advisor. Yeah, I don't know what that one Alert. is. I, <laughs> I've never heard of this one. I'm, I'm sitting on the edge of my seat. I can't wait to learn it. So we go to alerts and now we can have it speak all alerts. If you have Bluetooth connected to your Bluetooth headset, you'll hear the altimeter setting and the ATIS frequency. And these are all the alerts you can have set. Uh, I have uh, terrain obstacle alerts off because I like to buzz tap. I'm kidding. I like everything on, <laughs> but here is somewhere in here will be there be a sync rate if you're going down to to a high rate of descent. Uh, let's see airspace alerts if you're approaching TFR is a great one to have turn on. Uh, you can set the altitude buffers for airspace and for TFRs where it's going to alert you. But somewhere in here is the alert for the altimeter setting destination weather frequency alerts right here. That's for the ATIS and then nearest. Uh, altimeter setting should be in here somewhere as somebody had suggested that they should have a check gear down alert and <laughs> I, I typed back an answer i agree i would really like to have that i do a lot of flying in complex airplanes <laughs> and i use when the the if you have the hazard advisor turn on and the ground starts to turn yellow around you that's a good time to make sure you've got three green down in green and I, I would suggest as a separate gear thing send a message to team at fourflight.com and suggest a check gear down alert. You know, some and you distance don't have to remember that website. You can go to more and then support and contact support right here. You can always just hit that. It's going to send an email to team at fourflight.com. It's going to give you a four flight question. It's going to put some information that they need in the subject you're from and then just type away here. Uh, hey, I need this, that, blah, blah, blah. So I'm going to cancel that. But that's a good way to get that email to Foreflight, tell them about the gear thing. Another thing Mike was talking about, since he mentioned it, was turn on the hazard advisor. And this is kind of a neat feature. Uh, not kind of, but it's an absolutely a neat feature. Um, right now it's using 11,500 feet here. As I'm planning, I can scale this down and say, if I am at this altitude, where is the hazard? And you can kind of see. It's closer to Mike than it is to me. If I zoom out, we look at the US here we change our altitude, you can see the lower we are, the more the hazards there are. And you gotta be pretty close to the coast to be below 1300 feet and not have a hazard. How close is that giving me a hazard for? Well, it depends. You can set that. And you can set that in your flight plan and you can go to, there's so much here. As I look at the clock, I'm just shocked that, you know, there's just no way we can get through so much. Brian, Brian, can I uh, come back to the uh, altitude alert for just a moment? Yeah. Because um, I fly in the back of airliners. I'm not, I'm not a cool guy like you. I'm just, I get to fly in the weather. But anyway, <laughs> but anyway um, on the, uh, you're thinking of, uh, and I think the, the user is thinking of transition altitude alerts. As you're descending below flight level 180, the iPad will tip you off that the nearest altimeter is such and so, and it's located at such and so airport. 
I see that all the time when I fly when I fly commercial. Uh, yes, I'm that guy in the back of the airplane using four. <laughs> anyway, and you haven't seen it flying your light aircraft because I could swear flying my Satabi around, I've had it pop up before. Near it, will, it will it it will pop up as you're coming in close to your destination airport. Yeah, with the ATIS frequency. That's the ATIS, yeah. but I mean, I've yeah. seen current altimeter pop up. If anybody knows, post it in the Q and A, and we'll put the answers on the frequently asked questions. At this point, you know, these are the rest of the tabs. I'm going to go over those and we're going to stop the recording and then we'll just answer questions. But the plates, and you can create binders like trip kits, documents, which we're going to talk about in great deal. There's so much to have and, and you can download a, a lot of stuff and create your own organization system here. Like, for example, I have a lot of the FAA handbooks here. One of the common ones that I like is the Aeronautical Chart User's Guide. Uh, to look up what symbols are. I have it all here at my disposal. These are all free books. Instrument Flying Handbook, Instrument Procedures, Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge. Great, great resource to have all of these. Be careful about, if you download too many of these, the iPad starts to really get heavy. So just get what you need. Or if you think you can carry it, just do like I did, download them all. <laughs> Imagery, great for the old style um, images that we used to see. It starts at broad scale, and as you go down this list, it goes into more refined information. The flights, that's where we're going to have all of our flights saved, and we planned, and we can change things. We can create a navigation log. We can send this to weight and balance, and we can actually proceed to file the flight plan from this page as well. So when we plan a flight, we'll send it right here. We can actually start here and start planning the flight here as well. Scratch pads. Uh, there are many different kinds of scratch pads to choose from, uh, and you can, you know, write whatever you want on there. Uh, craft is a handy mnemonic for copying an IFR clearance. Uh, but there are all different kinds of scratch pads that you can get here. If I try to find the, uh, where do you see the different ones? Uh, I'm at a loss, but there's, you can copy ATIS. There's one made for copying an ATIS. You click on the plus sign in the upper right. Oh, that's it. So, yeah. So if you just want to copy your ATIS, you click on ATIS and here it is. An Apple pencil is probably useful here because I don't write very well with this, but you can, uh, you know, overcast and temperature or the one thing that Mike, the only thing he writes down is uh, information Bravo. And that's, he just puts that because he's got to tell ground control. <laughs> anyway. So that's the scratch pad checklist is wonderful too. You can make up your own. You can get like, here's a 172 checklist and we can get the takeoff uh, checklist and you can go through here and you can have it speak to you and you answer it. Uh, you can say, yep, that's checked. Normal climb out is that speed that's checked. Uh, we're not doing a short, so that's checked. And, and you just go through your checklist and check these things. You can skip something and come back to it and so on. And you're going to easily see what you've skipped or where you left off. When I use a paper checklist, my thumb moves. Some people like this, some don't. And it's not a feature that you have in the basic plan either. And again, this is a soft button. Last I used was weight and balance, and it populates from whatever you had here. You can customize. Of course, you got a timer here. You can start that. Uh, for an IFR timer, um, you can have it count up or count down. Set your countdown time right there. Um, and then of all your things here, when we get to hooking this up to uh, X plane, we're going to use this devices here and it's going to see if you have a portable AHARS or whatever, you would make sure it's connected here. Four flights happy to sell me a century right here. You can see I can buy now. Um, but if I turn on my Sentry, it would show up here and, and you can connect to it. We'll also have X-Plane as a device you can connect to. And when we do that, this iPad will work with the simulator. That's really all we can have time for tonight. I'm going to go ahead and thank everybody for coming. If you watch the recording, um, this is a good prerequisite basic. We're going to get into so much more. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop that, but we're going to hang around and we're going to keep talking to you and answer some questions. Yeah, Brian, before we get into questions, could you just go over uh, how everybody can get wings credit? Yeah, so wings credit is going to automatically be given if you enrolled with your wings email address. Uh, we also had a place in the uh, registration if you have a different email address for wings that you put it in there. So it's all going to happen automatically. Um, so watch for wings credit in a week, within a week or two, you should see it. If you don't send an email, you can go to, uh, 
fourflightworkshops.com and uh, I can just show you a little bit on my website is uh am I sharing my screen I can't yes tell. okay so you scroll down and, and you can just submit a question here uh and, and say hey I didn't get my wings credit but give us a week or two to do it this is the website we'll have uh you know the previous the next workshop information all the past workshops just click on that it'll take you down here and we'll have the recordings linked here uh go back to the top and you can look at all the downloads and links that we referred to uh, a lot of handy ones here and if you have good ones yourself send them to us and we'll put them on here uh, but wings credit should happen automatically as long as you enroll with your wings email address Yes. And hey, Brian, uh, just one more quick question here. I got a couple people asked about it. how do you turn that taxi route button on? Yeah, let me get back to and I, I answered once in the Q&A, uh, but I see it. It's popped up again at least once. And, and let me just say there are at least dozens, maybe hundreds of questions that we couldn't get to. So keep them in there. We will say these questions and we'll make sure we address all the as much of them as, as we can in the next or future episodes. Absolutely. And there's so much. So we're going to, we may have to do this more than monthly just to, you know, maybe we'll have some intermediate workshops just to do Q and A's, but you were asking about the taxi uh, tool. The, yeah. You the taxi the route tool. Drawer and hit taxi route. Now you may not have that feature and there's a really, this is, this is a, what do you call it? One of their beta things. So they're still kind of like, not sure if they're going to keep it or if it's working. If you have the pro plan and you don't see that, go down to more. And I believe it's under account. Yep. yep. And then go down to four flight labs. This is not intuitive. Click on that and you need to turn it on right here. There's also a feature the enhanced weight and balance I mentioned earlier that might look different on yours than your instructors or vice versa. And you can turn that on and play with it as well. There are different uh, weight and balance views that you can use and different enhancements to using it. That's here also. But when, when they have new things they're trying out, it's gonna show up here in your account for flight labs uh, and so on. Yeah, and I'll just add on that weight and balance. I tried that enhanced weight and balance for a while and I recently turned it off because A, most of my students were using the original version anyway, and B, right. I, I didn't like it as much. Quite yeah, honestly. It's not as easy to just make quick changes and send your summary to your instructor. Yeah, if I flew something more complex, if I was flying a jet in GA, then yeah, I'd probably use it. But for my 182, it's overkill. Yeah. Uh, and we will cover weight and balance in a future episode. It's beyond the scope of what we had time to cover tonight, but it's yeah, an absolutely. important feature. It's a great feature and we will cover it in depth in, in the future. It is great. And so I have two airports here and you hit taxi route. It's going to say, well, which airport? The one near you, LAX, JFK. <laughs> uh, I pick LAX and there you go. And this is the taxi route support thing. The problem is if you're doing this, you, you, this is where you might miss um a clearance or a taxiway or go off into the grass I, I recommend doing this while you're stopped but you can also see that the orange areas are hot spots it shows the hot spots on that map as well and that taxi route advisor or, or taxi tool is not available at all airports only larger airports yeah. correct so yeah. just as a, as a reminder uh, that's there for larger airports but there's absolutely nothing wrong with going, taking the airport diagram and the uh, and your finger or an apple pencil and draw on the route by hand yep absolutely a, a great idea yeah and so what bob's talking about is i'm looking at this airport i just hit taxiway here and let's say i'm parked on the fedex ramp now this one still has that route i put in there but you can annotate by tapping the pencil i'm going to choose 27 point that's too much uh, <laughs> <laughs> i'll take that down to maybe 14 and i'm going to make it red uh, so I can see it really well. And then I'm over here on the FedEx ramp and they say, okay, hotel two, hotel alpha. And you can, you can draw that here. And if they say hold short of Lima, I do a big thing like that. It's just my shorthand. You can develop your own shorthand. Really handy. Clear it and done. But good, good advice, Bob. I totally agree with that. This is a lot easier to just draw on than it is to try to push all those buttons with your clearance. Yeah, I make my, I make if I if I have a student with four flight, they they don't get to not do it. 
Well, that's good. They should yeah. know how to use all the features and then decide for themselves what they're going to use. Absolutely. Notice there's three errors with this route. I don't have um, the field because I, you notice I've chosen my Cetabria. And it, <laughs> it can't make that length. So it's going to tell you and that my max takeoff weight has exceeded as planned and so on. And so it gives you a lot of warnings here in your flight plan. It's going to help you uh, protect you from yourself as it does for me. Well, if you really lean it out, I bet you could. <laughs> I don't know. It depends. Eastbound, maybe, right? You're it, right. It, the somebody, wind. But somebody asked the wind. if. Um, Somebody asked, and let me turn my camera on so I'm not just this disembodied voice. Um, somebody asked about um, near uh, uh, hiding traffic up at the flight levels. You know, they're in a 182 and they don't want to see the high stuff and all that. If you go into settings, and I hope they're still here. Settings? And, and go into settings and you go to. Um, filter for traffic. Filter for traffic, yep. And turn off distant traffic. Hide distant traffic, but not the high traffic. <clears throat> well, it will it will hide the high traffic. Anything if it's not within three, if it's um, more than fifteen miles away or more than three thousand five hundred feet above or below you. Oh, you see, I just learned that. I didn't know that. I thought it was only lateral distance. So I like that. Yeah, so we have so, all the traffic turned on now, and I'll I'll turn this sectional off so we can see them all, and you can see all this traffic all around. In fact, let me turn off the aeronautical as well. See all that traffic? So you're saying I go settings. Yep. Traffic and high distance traffic. I'll turn that on. Close it. And you should get Look at that. Well, it's, I still see a lot of them out there. Um, it's definitely maybe, filtered down. Yeah. So it will, it will, yeah, it will hide. Great feature. Yeah. So it is, that is available. Um, and I think that's on the ADSB side. You're you're getting the traffic off the internet right now. Yeah, so. and you can see I'm getting traffic off the internet right here. Yeah. When your ADSB is hooked up, you'll see that there as well. Uh, and while I'm got the mouse pointer right here, you can see it's uh, 8:49 p.m. Central is the oldest data on here. And right now, all I have is traffic. But if I were to turn on the radar and let's say airmits and sigmits and TFRs. If I turn all that on and then click on this timestamp, see the oldest thing is 8.35 p.m. It shows you what time each of those were obtained. And if you compare that to the current time, 8.49 p.m. on the clock, the radar was 14 minutes ago. It was uploaded 14 minutes ago. That's when the mosaic was created and uploaded. But those photos, the, the scans were taken even before that. So do not rely on this radar for tactical avoidance of weather. Uh, for that very absolutely reason. anything else uh, um somebody asked about cell data and i'd like to address that um yeah you can use a hotspot. i do that uh i've done i have students that do that but uh and you don't need cellular data if you have something like a sentry or a stratus uh or you're connected to uh, some of the garmin uh, and other transponders that have uh Bluetooth connection to the iPad that will get the that will get FISB data, flight information system uh, data that will get um, uh, ADSB in uh, data. However, um, I really like having the cell data on my iPad, and I, and I debated this because it was another another uh, line that I had to buy from my my provider, and it was <laughs> another another couple of bucks for the iPad. But what I like about it is I'm not dependent on my phone having a good connection or I've got two paths to get to four flights. So if I'm packing before a trip, I know I'm going to get it. Yeah, I, I agree. It's worth having. It's worth the few dollars a month. I, you, you will use it. I guarantee it. And with the um, external devices, the ADSB getting the FISB, that's going to give you traffic and weather, but you're not going to have the capability of filing a flight plan or or uh, opening or closing opening closing stuff like yeah. that yeah I, I love being able to open a flight plan safely you know not while i'm rolling onto the runway but once i get once i get the either at a non-tower before i announce that i'm departing or at a towered airport uh when it's you know when they're when they clear me to go i just hit one button and the and the bfr flight plan is open and that yeah. i just love being able to do that i agree and it's as easy as when you have your flight plan complete just hit file right here 
and you'll get a notification that it was filed successfully. Uh, so a lot of great, great features on that.